Welcome. You have entered the realm of 1111 Talk Radio. Your host is Simron. It's time to discover your own language with the universe. Empower yourself. Broaden your mind. Open your heart and discover who you are. Now, here's your host, Simron. You have been lying to yourself. You have been avoiding yourself. You have been distracting yourself. And that is why you are having the experience that you're living out of who you've been being and what you've chosen to use as your knowing. It's time to rise to a higher octave of experience. On today's show, I'd like to share a beautiful and rich conversation with the hosts of Sacred Rebellion, Laura Solomon and Kim Andrick. We discuss a lot about life, about the experiences of multidimensionality, and an understanding of what it means to be living, being, and knowing. Enjoy the show. I'm so excited about Simran being with us today. We might be here all day long, <laughs> but nobody's going to get bored. No, we have so much juicy stuff to talk about. So Simran is a speaker, artist, author, and a catalyst for love, compassion, and humanity. How mm-hmm. more delicious does it get than that? Mm-hmm. She advocates for visionary and mystic within each person by creating a sharing conscious, uplifting, and inspirational resources. She is a mystic and a mentor and a publisher of 1111 Magazine. And this is funny, I'm just going to say, probably not funny to either of you, but I know 1111 is a big thing and I think we might talk about it today, but it's never been something that I've noticed a lot. But in the last five days, I swear, (laughs) it's been happening so often. So it's like just on my radar now, but we'll talk about that. But she's a 1111 talk radio host and the author of multiple gold award winning books, including Conversations with the Universe, Your Journey to Enlightenment, Your Journey to Love, and then her latest books are a trilogy. Yeah. Living, The Seven Blessings of Human Experience, Being, The Seven Illusions That Derail Personal Power, Purpose, and Peace, and Knowing, The Seven Human Expressions of Grace, and Knowing is coming out in November. So the first two you can November, get November, December. No, no, no. I think it's November. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So she creates art, books, and online courses that bridge humanity's experience and expression of darkness and light. She's a TEDx speaker and a creator of the one woman show, The Rebel Road, connecting the dots from what was to what is. So we were fellow on, rebel. I know. We're on a rebel road right now. So welcome <laughs> to the rebellion, Simran. We're so happy to have you here. Uh, Kim and Laura, it's a pleasure to be with you. I've on to this trilogy. And especially, I mean, they it's all so beautiful and juicy, but I really found that the being, the being book really caught my attention. And I loved how it really talks about the barriers, right? To what keeps us from expressing our full selves and you know that you say that it's anyone it's for anyone on a personal or spiritual growth path who desires to live beyond their human condition and realize the deeply profound impact they can have i know that's not your only book but i'd love to just hear you talk about these books what inspired and what you hope to you know do with the books so this is a self realization series It took, uh, it was, it came out of a seven year experience. And what I garnered from that seven year experience is the full landscape of our multidimensionality. So the trilogy is actually all of you. It is one human being, but the three different multidimensional levels and the breakdown of those levels, uh, once you're within them as to what makes you you, what makes each one of us unique in ourselves and what we tend to contend with at different times in our lives. And so living the seven blessings of human experience is the general person. It's the persona, it's the identity, it's us getting through life, sometimes trudging through life, sometimes having an aha moment, most of the time actually unconscious, even though we want to believe that we're conscious but it's us trying to just figure things out and get through life. And we encounter a lot of things in that process, both the blessings that are beautiful and the unconventional blessings that we'll talk a little bit about more later. Being the seven illusions that derail personal power, purpose, and peace 
is the part of ourselves that is unconscious. And it goes into the many layers of ourselves beyond simply the unconscious and the shadow that many people that are on a spiritual growth path look at. It actually delves into the animal aspect of us and then goes further into the monster aspect of us and even the inner demons that we carry that are what are creating a lot of the issues in our world. We don't realize how impactful we are in what we hold within as far as rippling out into the world and creating the circumstances. Everything from the weather patterns that we have to you know, global events, to war, to the economy and health crises and pandemics, we participate in every single thing at some level because we're one with all of it. And knowing the seven human expressions of grace, which was supposed to come out in November, but has been pushed to February, it is the humanity within us. It is actually what we are here to achieve. We think we have touched humanity or we look at humanity as this larger global landscape of people as humanity, but we're not really accessing our true humanity. We live in a world that's quite apathetic, quite disconnected, very separate. And there are many things that take place where we're not really feeling what we need to feel. And so it is that gateway of humanity that actually is the doorway to divinity. And so through understanding and embracing these different multidimensional pieces of ourselves, which all exist at the exact same time, all of the time, <laughs> we get to understand why we're creating what we're creating and how we're creating that in the process of our lives. Wow, that's oh, a lot. I want to talk a little bit about, I was looking at the seven illusions that derail personal power, purpose, and peace. And so I'm looking at them and said, time, okay, I get that. Duality, all right, money, yep, hierarchy, identity, war. But there was one in there, evolution, that struck me. So I would love to understand your perspective on how evolution is an illusion that derails us. Yeah, I'm sure the scientist in you really grappled with that one. <laughs> no, I love it because I think about yeah. these things a lot. And so I I just want to pick your brain a little bit because I think there's probably yeah. something here for me to understand in a deeper way. So we, we've been conditioned in a lot of ways and we've been taught a lot of things. And most of what we all carry are belief systems and they're belief systems that came from someone or somewhere or through time or that we're carrying within the cells of our being and the blood within our our vessel and uh, deep in the marrow of our bones. But in actuality, you know, if we really look at everything and our responses to everything, we'd start to realize this deep conditioning that takes place. And one of the things that we are conditioned into believing, and it particularly is true in, in religion and spirituality, even in science, that we are evolving, that we are here to evolve, and that we are here to continue to grow, continue to do our work, continue to be better. But in truth, we are all the beingness of God. We are the divine presence. We are the many specks of that divine presence. We came in whole and complete. We came in knowing everything, but then got conditioned. And so you can't be in the process of evolving and also be the divine presence. You're either one or the other. And so the illusion that we buy into or that our personas and personalities and identities need is to continue growing. We need to anchor into our stories, into our wounds. We need to have protocols and practices to try to grow because we are so hooked on being who we are just so that we can have the opportunity to grow, to have a story, to say we overcame something, to live the hero's journey. But in truth, when we move beyond here, what are we? We are the divine presence. What are we here if we unclothed ourselves from every identity that actually exists within our mind and that we've created in our world? We would be the divine presence. Who would we be? What would we be if we let go of every thought, of every wound, of every emotion, of every judgment? We would be the divine presence. And so in that way, this is one of the very deep and subtle illusions that we have carried through time to keep this ongoing saga of time and life and story and humanity going when in truth we truly did just come as an experiment and it is all just the divine presence 
that has gotten lost in its own story. Mm. Yeah, it's like the work of evolving keeps us from being. It's a distraction. Yeah. It's a distraction. I see it. Mm -hmm. The closest I've had to that actual experience has been with in a plant medicine experience where it did just all go away. And I was right there and I just knew myself to be perfect, whole and complete. And it just was. And I wanted to stay there. (laughs) Well, and I was going to say by the the same token, I've experienced that too. And then we come out of that experience, come out of that ceremony. And not too long after that, I find myself challenged with the programming, right? Like the ways of thinking, my stories and my way of of thinking about myself and the roles that I have assumed and the fears that I have. Um, So yeah, I really love that. That whole process of healing, that process of evolving is really all a distraction from just being. Well, and so much of what's happening in the world right now, especially the things that cause grief, they are to open us to more of this truth. I have discovered personally in my own life that grief is a portal to that place of presence where it doesn't disappear quite as quickly. With plant medicine, with other types of protocols and processes, we get into that state and we have that opening and we have that sensation, but the human mind goes back to where it was. And so then we can't hold on to that place. But when you're in a state of grief and when you have experienced tremendous loss, all of a sudden you start to realize the degree of attachments that exist within your life. And it becomes very apparent that when we let go of these attachments, we start to let the identities go. And that's how we continually die within our experience before we actually physically die. I've been an individual from the time I was four years old. My greatest longing has been to be one with the divine presence, to seek to understand that, to know that, to embody that, to become that. And over the course of my life, I've had many, many experiences of loss and grief. And each time another identity had to pass, and I kept wondering, why is it that this experience keeps occurring in my life? And then it finally dawned on me that my underlying longing, my soul longing, has always been to embody and express the presence. And the only way that that can happen is if no identity exists. Mm. And so that's why also identity is one of the illusions. So is this what you mean by true love's kiss? Uh, Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That was another thing I was like. I want to talk about true love's kiss. (laughs) Yes, the true love's kiss. As I was going through a personal experience of, of incredible loss, and I began to become aware of these different aspects of myself and the ability to lower or rise into different octaves of experience, I began to feel into the elemental side of me, to the the part of my own humanity that had been be willing to be that true love, to have that kiss of what it meant to be woken up. And that's why in that third book, The Seven Human Expressions of Grace, the title is Knowing, it really is about embracing our own humanity and giving ourselves the grace. We can't truly receive divine grace until we are willing to give ourselves our own human grace. And so that's part of what that true love's kiss is. Mm. It's beautiful. It really is a romance. These three books are, for me, the divine romance of what it means to be. I wanted to write books that I wish I had had come with me as my instruction manual, just like a stereo system or refrigerator or vacuum cleaner comes with its own manual and guide of how to operate it. If I had the opportunity to write a set of manuals for myself or my kids or for the world, I wanted it to fully express any and everything we would encounter as human, how to rise above it into higher octaves, 
how to embrace the depths of ourselves all the way to the most monstrous part of ourselves, which truly has its own beauty as well, and how to rise to the highest light of our humanity so that we touch the divine within and truly experience that bliss, not that otherworldly bliss, not that bliss of escape, but that bliss of pure acceptance and knowing and really embracing life for what it's meant to be, not to be anybody, not to create anything, not to go build a business, not to go have a fortune, not to achieve fame, but to truly live in the simplicity and beauty of ever-changing life and know that that's enough. It's enough to just feel, to know life, to know the self, to embrace one another, and to truly touch what love is and not the distortions of love. Yeah, I would say that this feeling not enough, if when I'm struggling, if I can really peel back the layers, I find that's often there. And when I work with other people, it's it's there is that same just not being enough and it's a lie it's you know like that seems like the one of the biggest lies that i've lived with that most i was gonna say everybody right like Mm -hmm. you're born in religion says you're not enough the fashion industry says you're not enough school systems say you're not enough it's like as a child, you're barraged with that message that you're broken, that you're not enough. And then we talk a lot about that's the thing to overcome. And in the overcoming, I am losing, I'm being distracted from being. So it's just, it's so interesting. Well, and that's why I started off with the book Living. The blessings that I talk about in there are the unorthodox blessings that we receive. You know, they are the blessings of conflict and obstacles and challenge and darkness and all of those Chaos. things that we away from. But in actuality, those are the very things that rip from us these veils of illusion that rip away from us these uh, cloaks of doubt and insecurity that we continue to carry it is walking through those doors and facing those experiences entirely that we go beyond just silver linings. We actually begin to see the gold within ourselves, but it means walking directly through the experience instead of pushing away. As I went through a very intense loss and experience of grief, I had so many people tell me, just get on with your life. You know, just just go back to work, keep yourself move on. And that's one of the things that our society does is is it tries to push us forward to pretend that things don't happen. And that's how we lose our humanity. That's how we harden our hearts. That's how we get sick. It's part of the conditioning that takes place that is creating so many of the ills in our world. But what if we succumbed to an experience and said, I'm willing to commit to this darkness as much as I've been devoted to the light, because there's something in there. And that's what occurred with me. I had this sense that I've created books, I've created a magazine, I've created a radio show, I've created beautiful things of light in the world. And yet, I've just created this moment of severe trauma and darkness and loss. I've missed something. Because if I create my reality, if I am a spark of God that has the ability and the capacity to create anything and everything within my world, and I've done so. Well, why did I create this unless there's something for me to gain from it? So can I succumb to this darkness? Can I turn from what I perceive as light and find true light? And what I discovered was that true light is actually resting in the darkness, mm. that the light that I had created over the last 20 years with 1111 and all of my books and podcasts and social media as lovely as it is, it's artificial lighting. Hmm. And that's what's going on in a lot of the world. We've got wonderful artificial lighting occurring in the world. <laughs> but until we're willing to embrace and be swallowed whole by our own mm-hmm. darkness, we can't know the true light of the divine that's resting inside. It's in that void space. To be swallowed whole by the darkness. Yeah. Yeah, I use, for me, sometimes I use the word consent 
and I say, I consent to this. And it, yeah. it helps me to not feel like a victim, to feel like I'm participating in a way that I sense myself as powerful. And I realize that I have a choice and it's a consent, you know, and a lot of times it's a consent to see the miracle that's happening in front of me. Cause it's like, as long as I'm in that fighting or struggling or pushing or wanting it, you know, resist, like I can't resist, I can't see it. Mm -hmm. So if I can pause and say, I consent, yes. I, re I relax, I trust. It's like this trust, consent. Yeah, that Beautiful. doesn't always yeah. come easily to me, but it is. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you think we create the veils too? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think that all these veils are internal. They're not external. Yes. You know, it's all as much as we feel and see this world as real, and we see this vast universe high above us. It is my belief that it is the universe that is inside of us, mm -hmm. that everything that is outside really is pure projection, that we are experiencing completely for the purpose of our own soul growth, and that anything that needs to be dismantled, dissolved, deconditioned, it's all internal. There's no one outside of us that needs to be fixed. There's nothing outside of us that needs to be controlled. It is actually the release of control and the release of needing to fix anything outside and inside that needs to be let go of. That to me is the definition of the true spiritual rebel. It yeah. is our willingness to dive into our creative capacity, into our spark of the divine, and let that take hold of us and leave everything else in the dust behind it. Mm -hmm. mm. This episode of 1111 Talk Radio is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. Give online therapy a try at BetterHelp.com forward slash 11 and spell out the word 11 and get on your way to being your best self. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual. So when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can sometimes make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, has therapists that are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills which makes therapy the closest thing to figuring out some of the challenges. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient and accessible anywhere, 100% online. You can go to betterhelp.com forward slash 11, spelling out the word 11, and save 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com forward slash 11. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things at some point aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist at any time. It couldn't be simpler. As a world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists, available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash 11. Now back to our show. You are listening to 1111 Talk Radio. Simron is an award-winning author, publisher of 1111 Magazine, powerful speaker of wisdom, and a life mentor. Find out more at imsimron.com. Now, back to 1111 Talk Radio. You have been lying to yourself. You have been avoiding yourself. And you have been distracting yourself. And that is why you are having the experience that you're living out of who you've been being and what you've chosen to use as your knowing. It's time to rise to a higher octave of experience. A beautiful and rich conversation with the hosts of Sacred Rebellion, Laura Solomon and Kim Andrews. As much as we feel and see this world as real, and we see this vast universe high above us, it is my belief that it is the universe that is inside of us, mm -hmm. that everything that is outside really is pure projection, 
that we are experiencing completely for the purpose of our own soul growth. And that anything that needs to be dismantled, dissolved, deconditioned, it's all internal. There's no one outside of us that needs to be fixed. There's nothing outside of us that needs to be controlled. It is actually the release of control and the release of needing to fix anything outside and inside that needs to be let go of. That to me is the definition of the true spiritual rebel. It is our willingness to dive into our creative capacity, into our spark of the divine, and let that take hold of us and leave everything else in the dust behind it. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, Also really looking forward to seeing and, and hearing you talk about knowing and, you know, what you say is it's a return to a heart-based soulful intimacy. And we've been talking about that, but what I love in the materials is that you refer to the book as her. And you say that this is more than a book. She is a guide that will breathe, rage, cry, and pray with you while also standing beneath you. And what a beautiful illustration, you know, of what we look to spirit and what we look to the concept of God for to be with us during those times. So talk a little bit about what uh, readers can expect from this book coming in February. So the three books, as I said before, they make up the singular human being. And living is actually the divine masculine. When living in a lower vibration, it can become the shadow masculine. It is any range of the masculine energy within us, whether male or female, young or old. Being, the second book, is actually the divine child. Hmm. It is the part of us that got suppressed, the part of us that deep down knows it's playing a game, that it's in a play, Mm -hmm. that it's put on a lot of different costumes, and it is having an incredible time getting lost in its play, fully embodying each and every costume that it decides to embody because it knows deep down its truth and it'll eventually come back out of the play and move on to something else. And then the third book, Knowing, is the feminine and it is the rise into the divine feminine. And in spiritual circles, a lot of people talk about the feminine as this either airy, fairy, kind of feathery, flowy, you know, dancing around the fire kind of beauty, which it can be, or it is talked about as this part of us that has to take back her power and, you know, go back and, you know, dominate the masculine because the way it's been dominated and all these things. So that's another version of what the divine feminine is portrayed as. But what I have discovered the divine feminine to be is the raw, organic, feeling, womb space, the void that of creation that holds everything and the possibility of everything. It is the also the womb space that lets life cycle through and the things that need to decay must dissolve and decay and be grieved. It is the place where every feeling is felt all the way from the most dense to the highest ecstasy. The divine feminine can hold it all, and it's here to be witness to it all. So that third book, Knowing, is about really sinking into and letting the divine feminine presence within allow us to feel everything, to give ourselves the permission, or as Laura said earlier, the consent to really feel into every experience and every emotion as it comes, knowing that none of it is going to kill us because we're eternal and that all of it is going to strip away what is not true for us any longer so that we truly can merge these three aspects of us back into unification, the divine masculine, the divine feminine, and the divine child. And once we live with all three sets of eyes, the small eye, the pair of eyes that sees the world, and the greater eye that understands its place and presence in the world, then we can fully activate ourselves as true human beings and God's walking on this planet. Yeah, I love the idea of becoming human 
because I agree for myself and looking around that we have not become human yet. We haven't even <laughs> scratched the surface. I, I think maybe there have been some humans who have scratched the surface, but you know, very few of them that I know about were actually women. So I just think our potential, I get very excited about our potential when all of this is realized. And in the meantime, you know, it's, we are here to embrace our animal. You know, I think that being willing to accept and know the animals that we are, because that truly is how we're behaving at this time. (laughs) You know, we're sense filled and we're impulsive and we're reactive and we're instinctual and violent, (laughs) violent. You know, we're all these things that animals are, but until we recognize that, you can't even move to a higher octave unless you know what you are first. And that's the purpose of showing people these different parts, but also letting them know when something shows up in your life that you don't like or doesn't feel good, there is an aspect of you, a dimension of you that is operating at that vibration that is creating that. It's not just some random happening or some accident or not even karma that doesn't really exist. It is you operating on different levels, but you're not aware of certain levels that are active. And once you get to know those levels and get to see how those levels think and feel and speak and sense, then when you're in any situation, you can pause and say, okay, I'm living through this experience, but how am I being in this moment? And you're either being divine or you're being human or you're being animal or you're being monstrous, or you're being a demon. Mm. And you will know by the words, the thoughts, and the actions that are being expressed, and the energy. Yeah, that hits me. (laughs) (laughs) The other thing that I wanted to ask about was, you said that these books are not meant to be read quickly but only partaken in one to two paragraphs a day or opened randomly as an oracle. So yeah, talk a little bit more about that to the readers who want to really get the full value from their book. Well, I'm going to say, I'm glad that you even put that out there because I was reading some of it and it was like so rich and deep and I was like, I'm going to have to chew on this for a while. Like, you know, it is a very rich offering and a deep the offering. Book won't, the books won't let anyone read it quickly. It's just not <laughs> possible. It's written in such a way to slow people down because we move too fast. We have become a distracted society. We don't even know how to sit and be present. And it's very, they're very dense. Mm-hmm. All three, I've always written very dense books, and these are probably the densest of them <laughs> that I've written. But they are rich. And so my recommendation for people, and I think that the reason that the publisher opted to release Living and Being right now and hold off on knowing is because those two books, that work has to be done before you delve into the work of knowing. And you can do these simultaneously. And the way to do that is to read a few lines or one paragraph of living in the morning or being in the morning, choose one or the other. And then in the evening, read one paragraph or a few lines of living or being, whichever you choose. And in that way, you're going to start to absorb the information. Your own mind will start to contemplate and become curious about certain things. I've written five different ways people can actually read these books. And you can go slowly right through the book. You can open them randomly as an oracle. You can put them side by side. And if you're going through a a chaos moment, you know, read the section on chaos and then go to the correlating section in being that has to do with chaos and the type of being that would create that. So there are multiple ways to actually read this. There's even bold quotes throughout the book that if you never read anything else but the bold quotes, you would have such aha moments because each one is such a divine morsel that it could take you days to contemplate that and let it unfold in you. And so that's why it's meant to be the type of thing that sits by the bed. I've had several interviewers move through the books and say to me, this is like the Course in Miracles. It's one of those eternal Mm. uh, set of books that people will contemplate for times well beyond your lifetime. And that's what it felt like when I started writing them. 
And so, you know, hopefully this is something that people take in very, very small morsels and just savor inside of themselves until it works into every single cell and bone and through their blood to where it becomes a part of their being. What a gift to all of us. Okay, so I have something, I'm not sure how this relates, but it's been coming up for me. So I want to know how this correlates. It's pleasure. Mm. Like the pleasure of being in a body, having a body, the animal, just where does that fit into all of this? Like the positive, the negative, yeah, where we get caught up with that one. So ultimately where the books will take you is to this place of neutrality and equanimity so that there are not the spikes that take place as we experience as animals. Uh, When we're in our true humanity, we will feel the full range of everything. But by the time you get to that place in knowing, you will start to realize that all of this is the beauty of the human landscape. And you'll begin to appreciate the tears. You'll begin to appreciate the anger. You'll find pleasure in those moments because you're so present to the experience of being human that you'll realize this is the ecstasy that I came for. I've always said you are experience experiencing itself. You're not on a journey. You are the journey. And so that brings us to this place of pleasure. That is much different than passion. Pleasure is something that's felt from the inside out. It's something that flowers very much like forgiveness and very much like unconditional love. It has to birth from the inside so that you can be in a complete state of grief, crying tears. And yet at the same time, there's this fullness that starts to rise up. Ah, this is being human. This is what this color of humanity feels like. Whereas if we look at passion, passion is something that is actually a shadow quality. It's a very low vibration. It is, they often say, go find your passion, go find your fire. Well, what does fire do? Fire burns. And so we have to really look at the language and the vibrations of what we're buying into based on society and go to a deeper, subtler level of some of these words that we use as language and open up to the pleasure of duality, the pleasure of being human. And to the average mind, they're going to look at that and say, well, who finds you know anger pleasurable? Who finds getting wounded or going through a divorce or any of these things that we end up in with as being human. But once you can get to this place of neutrality around all things and you start to see that you've actually created all of it and you've created it for a purpose and that a certain level of your being has been very active in it, there is a level of humor that starts to rise in the same way that we say that the universe laughs all the time at us there comes a point where we start laughing at ourselves, at the absurdity of what we believe we've become when in fact we are so much more. I hope that answers your question, Laura. Yeah, it's like this, I don't know if I, like a sense of playfulness or fun or, you know, I don't know how that relates to the the human experience. I guess what I'm getting is, not being attached to whether something feels fun or just finding pleasure in just the experience. You know, I remember my son when he was three years old and we were out in the yard and he was just enamored with an airplane that was in the sky. And he was, you know, running around the yard, just, you know, arms up and making the noise and giggling and laughing. And, and then he tripped over something. It didn't get hurt because he looked up at me. You know how kids do that sometimes. They'll look up at you. Like, am I hurt? <laughs> but then all of a sudden, he just broke out into a tantrum. So then he was in the yard, you know, hammering his fists into the ground, kicking his feet, rolling over, red-faced, and completely sweating. And then a butterfly happened to fly right mm-hmm. over him. And he stopped in an instant. And he was back up running and laughing again. <laughs> That is the playfulness of which we are really here to be as divine children. The problem is we get hooked. 
we get attached to something, we have to create a story around it. Then we have to repeat the story for eons. And then we create our reality, <laughs> our new relationships based on that story. So we continue to live in the past. And rather than just being a child and being in the moment and having the experience and then moving on to the next one, we carry everything with us like baggage on our shoulders. My child it, no more thought of that airplane when he was on the ground having a tantrum. And he no more thought of the tantrum when he was off chasing the butterfly. Mm -hmm. He easily left those things behind. And if we can learn that, then we can be a lot freer. We can be playful. We can dive into the things that our human mind says is play, that we've made up as play because we've made our lives such drudgery and heavy and work filled <laughs> that we can start to realize any of it can be play. Yeah. But what we're required to do is choose the things that fulfill us. Right now, most of us are running programs where we're not even living things that fulfill us. We're doing things out of obligation, out of conditioning, out of trying to be accepted or be like others, rather than just being rebellious and saying, you know what? I don't want to do this. I want to do something else because that fulfills me. And when we start to really act in that way in life and not be attached to the projections of other people or the conditioning of ourselves, then freedom, fulfillment, pleasure, all of those things start to fall into place. Beautiful. I feel like we could talk all night, but um, <laughs> I wonder if you're ready for the lightning round, Simron. Sure, sure. Let's go. <laughs> One, what rules have you chosen to rebel against on your journey to health? Mm, you know, I grew up in a culture where work was really the focus and tradition and following the rules. And so for me, a lot of my life has been about stepping outside of that cultural conditioning, moving beyond the acceptance and approval of familial systems and cultural systems, being willing to totally embrace being the rebel, even if that meant being outcast or something happening that didn't feel good, but staying true to myself. And I would say most importantly, it has been to be completely committed to feeling everything. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. that is a real key to health. I yeah. know that we should not get drowned within the emotions in a way that they take over our health, but we should be emotionally intelligent and allow the feelings to wash through. Otherwise, they, they create a lot of havoc. Amen, sister. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. And I feel like you've answered this, but maybe we can bring it down into just a few sentences would be, what does it mean to you to be holy? To be completely and utterly human. Mm. Mm -hmm. Love it. <laughs> level. And last question, what do you want to say to a listener right now to help them rise up? You have bamboozled yourself into <laughs> the stories that you have been told and that you continue to tell. You have been lying to yourself. You have been avoiding yourself. And you have been distracting yourself. And that is why you are having the experience that you're living out of who you've been being and what you've chosen to use as your knowing. It's time to rise to a higher octave of experience. So I invite you to experience a higher level of living and embrace all of your blessings of experience to activate your highest state of being by diving deep into the well of all of your being and letting go of the illusions that have derailed your personal power, purpose, and peace. And to finally embrace your humanity by knowing all that you are and granting yourself your own seven graces so that you can open yourself to divine grace. There's only one in the room. It's you and God. So in this moment, I'll ask you to close your eyes and breathe and center into your heart. And as you do so, I want you to imagine all of the little inner children of your own. I want you to imagine the ones that feel scared, that feel anger, upset, 
wounding. I want you to hold the ones that don't understand and breathe into that space in your heart. And as you do so, I want you to inhale and exhale to the count of four, six, or eight. Breathing deeply, allowing a beautiful lotus flower to begin blooming inside of your heart. As it begins to unfurl, it is translucent. Each inhale brings light to the translucent petals, allowing them to unfurl. And each exhale allows the lotus flower to expand and grow. Inhale in love. Hold the breath of love. Exhale with love. Hold the space as love. Inhale in love, opening up this lotus flower. Hold the breath of love, allowing the filaments of this flower to sparkle and radiate light. Exhale with love, allowing this lotus to expand and hold the space as love to be the sacred transformation that occurs inside. Inhale in love. Hold the breath of love. Exhale with love. Hold the space as love. Inside of this lotus flower, you see all of your little children. You see the sacred being that you are and the light that you possess. And as you continue to breathe, allow the line of light that is within these sacred beings that are one inside the other, inside the other, inside the other, to extend high into the heavens and deeply into the earth. And as it does so, connect with the heart that you are resting in. As you hold your inner children, who is the mother that is holding you? The great mother has her arms wrapped around you. This mother that has always been, has cradled your dreams, has held you close, has held the vision, and has held you sacred. This great mother has you clasped to her chest. You are connected to her with an everlasting umbilical cord that is your breath. This great mother Hold you safe. Hold you safe. Forever hold you safe. You have never been disconnected. You have always been held. You simply forgot the feeling of her hands around you. Imagine yourself in her arms as a small child. The Great Mother has always held you close to her bosom. She is always nurtured. She is always provided. Inhale in love. Her love. Hold the breath of love. Her love. Exhale with love. Her love. Hold the space as love. Her love. This great mother holds you. And as you feel yourself nestle inside her arms and her heart, you notice sitting beside you are your brothers and sisters of the world, each swaddled in their own clothing, each with their own dreams having taken their own path, but all from this one great mother. In this moment, send love and light to your mother in gratitude of remembrance and express in whatever way inside of you that you will not forget that she holds you. You will not let the ego or the mind of the world take custody from the one who has always loved you, who has always held you. Inhale and exhale. 
bring yourself back into the presence of the lotus, back into the presence of your body, into the presence of your fingers and your toes, your ankles and your wrists, your back against the chair. Bring yourself to the presence of your hair, the filaments of consciousness that extend from your skull. Bring yourself to your neck and your voice. Wiggle your shoulders, your fingers and your toes. And when you're ready, cast your eyes downward and bring yourself back into the space. Knowing that you are held by the mother, that she has never left you. And with each step you take, you simply have to imagine and you're in her heart with your fingers wrapped around her little pinky. Religion. Interfaith. Faith. And oneness. Let us walk forth and let our religion be love. The open-hearted, non-judgmental, everlasting love of our brothers and sisters. Let our interfaith be the connecting threads amongst us all, simply different languages that connect us to mom. Let our faith be in ourselves, for the power that we hold simply by being present, by knowing that our presence is enough, by understanding that our willingness to be with ourselves and each impulse and thought and emotion and feeling that rises is the only work that we have to do on this planet. And our oneness. Let us be with the separation that is outside as we bring it into a place of oneness in our vision. Let us stop looking with the duality of two eyes and focus on the higher vision of the one eye. For in the vision we hold, a new world we will create. We have to understand that 99% of the time, we are actually living from our shadows. Every time you have a thought, an impulse, an action, or a reaction, is coming from the small you, the limited you, the personality, and the identity. Stop for a second and say, who is being angered and upset here? Who wants to lash out? Who wants to do something? Who is it that wants to be something? And understand that that is all your condition that has risen up. And in that moment, allow yourself to unzip that skin. Because that's all it is. It's a costume. It's a skin. And when you unzip it, there's no form left. There's only light. Because you are bigger than the skin you're in. And that is the work that we are here to do on behalf of the mother. So thank you for letting me be here with you, my brothers and my sisters. Light. I appreciate the beauty of the costumes and the forms that you have placed on. I look forward to dancing with you in the light and the shadow, because only in the recognition of both of them, in the embrace of the shadow, may we release the gift and embrace our God essence. So thank you for letting me be with you. In love, of love, with love, and as love, I am Simran. lovely i think i might listen to that every day in my life (laughs) (laughs) oh so So in in addition to getting your books and diving into those how and listening to your 1111 radio show how else can people work with you get more of you spend time in your space and my websites are iamsimran.com and 1111mag.com uh, all of my work 
if you go through my books, they really give you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessary in your process. And these books were written without any of my stories so that you could place yourself inside of them and your own story inside of them. However, if for some reason you need some facilitation or some support as you go through the process, then I'm willing to work with individuals that are truly committed to reaching their highest potential. Such a pleasure having you. Such a pleasure. Yes. Such beautiful work. I feel like I'm going to be digesting, feasting and digesting and taking more and more (laughs) of this in maybe for decades to come. Yeah, absolutely. The time isn't real. So (laughs) it's an illusion. Thank you, Laura Solomon and Kim Andrick for a beautiful interview on Sacred Rebellion podcast. It is a space for exploring the connection between physical and spiritual health while staying grounded in our modern world. Our faithful act of defiance is focused on our sovereignty in our body, mind, and spirit. Join Kim Andrick and Laura Solomon as they continue to shatter the stereotypes of what it means to be healthy and holy. You can find out more at laurasolomon.com. I invite you to get your copies of this very profound sacred trilogy and begin to deepen into your multidimensional self, ordering your copies of living, being, and knowing, reading through them very slowly or using them as oracles and remembering that they work across the three books as much as they go down into the layers within each individual book. You can use these as oracles by opening them randomly or picking a section within one book and then going to the correlating sections in each of the other two. It's time for us all to expand into the full dimensionality that we hold. Until next time, I am Simran. In love of love with love and as love, be well. Thank you for opening your mind to a new reality your heart to greater compassion, and your experience of aliveness with 1111 Talk Radio. Join host Simron next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern Time to step through the gateway of conscious living here on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. Remember, you are not on the journey. You are the journey.